Now we can do question and answers from anything from the weekend. Yes. Did, did you guys want to bring a hand mic down for the questions? I don't know. Guess not. Go ahead. When I was a teenager, I developed a lot of phobias, claustrophobia, and it motivated me to study psychiatry. Um, I was intrigued by the fact that your profession has the highest rate of suicide. That, that's actually not true. That, that's, that's an old wives' tale that actually isn't true. He, he says that the psychiatry has the highest rates of suicide. Yeah. Okay. Um, was, oh, there's microphones. Come up to the mics and ask your question. That'd be good. If anybody has a mic, they're, they're on the stands right here and here. So just come up to your mics and ask your question. But, but that, that's not true. The, hello? No, no, no. I just, I just, uh, I think that he asked if there's any truth to psychiatry having the highest rate of, of suicide, and I just don't think that that data has been. Uh, I think the data used to be said that way, but I haven't seen that confirmed recently. And I've seen some data recently that denies that that's true. So I, I don't, I'm not buying into that. So I don't really want to comment on it. And I have uh, one other question. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that fructose sugar was a uh, hazard to. Yes. Um, is there any hazard, actually, in eating fructose in fruits? I mean, if you... No, no. High fructose corn syrup is, is, ten, is 10 times more oxidizing than sugar. So if you decide to drink a, a drink with high fructose corn syrup in it, you can have 10 with sugar in it, sucrose in it, for the same oxidizing damage to your body. So it's high fructose, not fructose from fruit. Other questions? Yes, over here. Um, do you have a dose for your fish oils that you use? Dose of what? The fish oils are the... Yes, I, uh, three to 4,000 milligrams total a day. Three to 4,000, and there is prescription strength out there. You can ask your doctor to write a prescription. Uh, and if you get a prescription, it's pharmaceutical grade, so you can be sure it's going to be high quality with none of the, like, if you're concerned about mercury or things like that, even though mercury is protein bound, it's likely not to be in the oil anyway. You're going to get good quality stuff if you get a pharmaceutical grade, and in most, most insurance will pay for it. Do you have a brand that you particularly... Well, I, I just generic now. There was only a branded Loveza. Loveza is the brand name, but most of the insurances just will require you get a generic brand now. You go ahead. Oh, okay. So with the sleep schedule and everything, like I've heard that, um, I don't know if this is true, but like the best sleep is before midnight or whatever, but I work night shift. So what do you suggest for like people who work night shift and getting your eight hours of sleep and stuff? Getting off night shift. <laughs> people who work night shift chronically will live 10 years less. You'll lose 10 years of your life working night shift and you'll have significantly higher rates of dementia. Pardon? How many years? I think it was more than five years of night shift. It reduced it. The longer you work, the more damaging it is. Night shift is very oxidizing. Very oxidizing. It's very, very damaging working night shift. So, um, no, I would get off night shift. I worked night shift for two years when I was young. And uh, I don't know if there's a long-term consequence or if that, I could handle it then. But I can tell you, I did not function well. I did not feel well. I was never, it never did as well. My cognitions were not as well. You, you're out of sync with everything uh, doing that. So I would take, get off night shift. I mean, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to. But if you can, get off night shift. Yes. Um, on flaxseed, so it has no omega-3 or it, it's not beneficial? Flaxseed has ALA, short chain omega-3, which is not beneficial to your brain. Your brain cannot use ALA omega-3. Your brain uses DHA, EPA omega-3, which are longer chain omega-3 fatty acids. Your body can only convert 1% or less of your ALA into the form the brain needs. So it's really not very helpful for the human brain to do that. That doesn't mean that it's, it's unhealthy to do it. It just doesn't have the same benefits as the long chain omega-3s. Okay, hand in the back, hand up here in the front. Oh, over here, go ahead. Uh, have you heard of kom kombucha, the drink? I have not heard of it. You haven't? Okay. I won't ask the question. Thank you. Okay, go ahead in the back. Uh, she w I'm going to translate for her two questions. Go ahead. Okay. What? 
anos fazer futebol, de 15 anos fazer futebol à noite, e é também os sucos verdes, se é bom. Porque é duro. Ask, asking about the green juices, which is any benefit. And the other question is, playing sports late at night. If there's any... Okay, wait, ask the first question. Green juices? Yes. It depends on the juice. Um, the, the green juice, you have green apple juice. Would it have some benefit? Potentially. You can have, there's some other green juices out there. Like There's something called naked. Um, spinach and stuff. So yeah, if you, if you, if you like make a juice out of kale and spinach and some other stuff, you're going to have a lot of good antioxidants and stuff out of that. So yeah, they can be beneficial too. But I have not seen studies that look specifically at those in reducing risk of dementia. But they're going to be antioxidants, so they're going to be helpful and have a lot of nutrition. Okay. And another question? About sports playing, I guess she's concerned about uh, teenagers, young people playing sports late at night. Or at night. Yes, no, that's exactly right. Uh, kids that play sports that increase the risk of head injury will increase their risk of having dementia later in life if they have head injury during their sports. But high contact sports like uh, high school football, um, those kids are going to have an increased risk of other health problems later in life, whether it's joint injuries and so forth, or if they have head injury, then increased risk of dementia later in life. And there's even some concern, and I haven't seen it proven, but I've seen it written about as a concern to watch for, kids who play soccer who, do, who head the ball. Heading, heading in soccer will cause uh, damage to the brain over the time, increasing their risk of dementia. If you had to pick out of all these recommendations, the number one recommendation that's most beneficial, what would that be? Exercise. Diet and exercise, those are the two. Diet and exercise, the two big ones. And then stress management and education, those are the four big ones. Yes, right there. Coenzyme Q10, uh, is that... Uh, I, I didn't understand you. Coenzyme Q10, is that uh, helpful oh, for Coenzyme older Q10. people? Yes, what's your question about Coenzyme Q10? For, for older people, do, they, do we have to have supplement of that? Is that helpful? There is data out there that supports that coenzyme Q can, it can be beneficial to cellular function and uh, antioxidant benefit and health benefits to it. There is data out there that supports that. I didn't put it in my book. I didn't, uh, I didn't really feel it was strongly associated with anti-dementia uh, 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 anti benefit yet, but, but I, don't, I don't think there's anything that would suggest it's, it's harmful. Yes, so whoever's got the mic back there. You mentioned that you take a supplement of N-acetylcysteine. I'm wondering yes. if, there's, if it's taken in conjunction with anything or if there's a specific brand preference that... Yeah, I, I, just take, um, I just take three 500 milligram capsules every morning. And it's over the counter. I use the Jaro brand if that's what you wanted to know. Yes? You talked about the importance of sleeping yes. a minimum of seven hours an evening. What about cat naps of 30 minutes to an hour during the day? Yeah, um, is, if it doesn't interfere with total sleep, that's okay. In fact, there's some data that shows those cat naps can be quite helpful and can improve memory consolidation. See, memories consolidate during sleep. I didn't, I didn't really go into all the sleep, but memories consolidate during sleep. When you're studying and trying to learn something, it's going into your short-term memory, your hippocampus. During sleep, it actually gets chemically transferred out of your hippocampus into your cortex for long-term storage. If you don't get normal sleep, then you will not retain as much later. So college students, all-nighters are stupid. Study, sleep, you'll have better, better retention. They actually took a group of college students, and they uh, had them memorize words they'd never heard before. And then they tested both groups right after the memorization period. One group they let go sleep. The other group they kept awake. And then they brought them back and tested them both again. Not only did the group who slept score better than the group who didn't sleep, they scored better than they themselves did right after the memorization period. Sleep improves memory retention. Now, most of the sleep aids, not all, most of the sleep aids prescribed by doctors chemically interfere with memory consolidation. You'll have memory problems if you use them. They alter sleep architecture. That would be all the benzodiazepines, clonopin, Xanax, Ambien, Lunesta, um, all those types of family of medicines will cause memory problems if you use them chronically. Uh, and then there are other memory, memory um, sleep aids that, that can cause memory problems for other reasons I'm not going to go into. So um, anyway, sleep is very important for memory consolidation as well as just brain health. There's a question here. Yeah, and what about coconut oil? 
that's my... Yeah, I don't have any data on coconut oil. I, uh, coconut oil would, uh, for dementia prevention would likely be related to the fact that it is very low in linolenic acid. And because it's very low in linolenic acid, it doesn't have the cannabinoid effects and therefore doesn't increase the appetite. And there is data to show that it then reduces um, uh, potential obesity compared to the um, soy oil. And so that, could, and that would then reduce inflammatory cascades and potentially have benefit. Yes. Well, firstly, I, I thank the Lord for sharing your uh, information to us. I've definitely learned a lot today. And uh, you have some quotation from Ellen White. I'm a little bit confused here. Uh, on the testimonies for the church, page uh, 365 says, tea has an influence to excite the nerves and the coffee benumbs the brain. And she says both are highly injurious. So I'm not sure what's the benefit that you had. Is it far more beneficial what she's talking about injurious? I'm not quite sure what she means by that. I'm, I'm not, I didn't hear a question. What was your question? I heard a statement. What's your question? Well, the question was, like I said, um, uh, Ellen White says in Testimonies for the Church, he says the tea has an influence to excite the nerves. No, I know what she says. What's your question? The question is, yeah, what's the be what she's talking about when both are highly injurious? I'm not quite sure what she means by that. I guess you'll have to ask her. <laughs> I, I, she didn't tell me. Well, I know the benefit that you mentioned earlier. I was also thinking, so, what is the... So do we know that the tea that they had back then and the coffee they had back then is the same thing that we're using today? Do we know that? I don't know about that. We don't know that. We don't yes. know how it was prepared. We don't know how it was grown. We don't know how it was cooked. We don't know what they added into it. We, I don't know that. I'd have to do that research. Um, for instance, I can tell you, the, for instance, the decaf coffee today doesn't have any benefit. Same, same beans, but once you remove the caffeine from it, you don't get any of the antioxidant benefit, none of the dementia risk benefits, none of the lower mortality risk benefits, and that's one, one change in the same coffee bean. What were they doing to the coffee back then? How were they processing it? How were they preparing it? Um, Ellen White writes in, um, in various places that drug medications should not be used, that they are poisons to the system and they should not be used. Well, when medical students from Loma Linda wrote her and asked her about that, they said, do you mean the drug medications that we use as doctors like arsenic, strychnine, <laughs> laudanum, and mercury. And she said, yes, those are poisons. They shouldn't be used. Now, if somebody didn't write and ask that, then people read her writings today and go, boy, drug medications. And there are people in our church today that won't use drug medications because she used the term drug medications. But in her day, drug medications meant poisons. That's what they were back then. So I don't really know contextually whether what she's describing in her day has the same application for what's going on today. I can tell you today what the science shows. And what the science shows is that all-cause mortality is reduced by caffeinated coffee. Reduces Parkinson's, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, all of them are reduced by drinking coffee, caffeinated coffee. That's what the science shows. I don't know that Ellen White had the same data that we have today, and I don't know that she's referring to the same substances exactly because things change over time. I agree. Um, like I said, I didn't grow up as an Adventist, so I'm just uh, new in the, in the uh, faith. So, I'm, like I said, I just want to clarify what's, uh, what's up. But I appreciate the data that you have mentioned. Thank yeah. you, sir. And I would say if somebody, by the way, if somebody feels conscientiously that because Ellen White wrote that, that they would go against their conscience to drink coffee, you should not drink coffee. Paul said in Romans chapter 14 about foods offered to idols, those who have weak faith should eat only vegetables. Those with great faith can eat anything they want. And the point being here was not dietary primarily, but if you believe that your, your, your meat that you bought in the meat market had been offered to an idol, and that there, therefore if you eat the meat offered to the idol, the idol has power over you, then you better not eat it. You have weak faith. If you know that idol is just nothing but a piece of stone, it can't affect the nutrition of the food, well, eat anything you want then. Okay? If you're going to drink coffee and feel guilty about it, the guilt will activate inflammatory cascades causing uh, ele elevated cytokines and increase your risk of... So don't drink the coffee. <laughs> yes. No, over, somebody over here had their hand up. Yes. Um, you mentioned briefly a lot of denial in the evolutionary community, and I'm just wondering how you would approach a conversation with somebody that wanted to talk about evolution and the existence of God. So, and so I, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. I, I mentioned denial. 
Um, you said when you were talking about... Oh, denial in the scientific community. Right, right, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how would you approach a conversation with someone that wanted to discuss evolution and the, the existence of God, and do you have any lectures aimed at people who don't believe in God? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And in, my, in, the, in the new book that I have coming out in June, there's, in two, several different places, I weave in the, the evidentiary base between which is healthier for the brain and which is going to reduce your risk of dementia, an evolutionary worldview or a creationist worldview and why, and show the science of those. And actually, the creationist worldview is, has much stronger scientific basis and is healthier for you than an evolutionary worldview, unless your view of God is an authoritarian dictator. So the healthiest view of your mind Mind is a creator God whose design laws are the laws upon which reality are built and who is a loving, beneficent creator as Jesus revealed him to be. That is the healthiest by far. But it is much healthier. The next healthiest is to believe in no God, but be an altruistic person who cares about other people. And the worst view is to believe in an authoritarian God that caused you to live in fear and you are likely to want to take control of governments and force people to, like, like, look at the Taliban today, look at the church in the dark ages, look at what some Christians want to do to the laws in this country, force other people to live because that's how God works. That is the most unhealthy. And all that's going to be in the new book. I have a lecture which I don't have anywhere on the website yet. I've done it several places. And it's called On um, the Science of Belief, even though there's an old version of that. The new version goes into quantum mechanics and quantum physics, and I show how, um, through the quantum entanglements, how our prayers and our goodwill and love intentions for other people actually have an impact on healing and miracles and, uh, and connected to um, a belief in God. And so there's actually a really good scientific basis to show that, that there's a really good scientific basis now for everything the Bible teaches, and the Bible is much more holistically accurate than any other religious documents in the world. Yeah, that's a good, I need to, do, I, I'm thinking about making a new DVD set here in the near future, and I might put that on that. I'm thinking about that. Yes, over here. Okay. Um, in your review of literature about sleep, did you come across anything to, for helping people with restless leg syndrome to have better sleep? I wasn't looking for treatment for sleep disorder. I was looking for the relationship between sleep disorders and dementia. And so I did not really research the treatment, but to answer your question, um, Dopaminergic agonists um, um, are effective for treating restless leg, and they don't interfere with sleep architecture. And there's several different ones out there that your primary care doctor, your neurologist, your psychiatrist can prescribe for you, and that really does well for resolving the restless leg syndrome. It's a dopaminergic agonist. Um, I can't think of the name of a couple of them right now. Anybody? Requip. Yes, thank you. Requip is one of them. But there's several. Well, back to the sleeping problem. Uh, what do you think about melatonin? Back to what, wait, wait, what problem? <laughs> I'm sorry, sleeping problem. Okay. The free, uh, melatonin. I was told that melatonin would be very helpful. I'm afraid to, t I mean, not afraid, but I hesitate to take it. What do you think about melatonin? Melatonin is perfectly healthy to take. Your brain makes melatonin, at least it should, unless there's a problem. Um, and melatonin is destroyed by light in the morning. So melatonin, up to... The, the sleep doctors that I know prescribe up to 10 milligrams a night of melatonin. There's a question down here somewhere. Somebody had their hand up? Yes, right here. Is there one back there? Yeah, go ahead while he's bringing the mic up here. Um, I was wondering about the hormone replacement therapy and the risk of cancer. What, did, what were your thoughts on that? Well, the data I saw in these studies, again, it was related to, okay, so it depends on your genes. Mm -hmm. If you have a high risk of breast cancer that is estrogen sensitive, then mm -hmm. adding the estrogens in can increase your risk of breast cancer. So I would tell you, you need to consult with your primary care doctor or your prescriber about those risks in your particular life. That was not really looked at for this study. It was looked uh, irrespective of those risks, does it have a benefit in reducing dementia over time mm -hmm. and cardiovascular disease, which it does if it started within the first five years. But for certain people, it could potentially increase risk of cancer, so that's why you should, would, would want to consult with your doctor before you started it. A question, is um, stevia extract um, good? Because I use that in my coffee. Yeah, I, would, I personally recommend avoiding stevia. Oh. Most stevia that is prepared in, is not pure stevia, and there's actually several, um, you can look online on the stevia hoax, 
and you can get some of the data that shows that stevia is uh, promoted as the, the latest, greatest, but it's actually probably neurotoxic. So I don't use stevia, and I don't recommend stevia. Um, I don't recommend any of the sweeteners. Um, what I use in my coffee, I, I should have said this, I should have put this. <laughs> don't know why I didn't say it. Uh, because I didn't put it in the book because it was recent research since I turned the manuscript and the manuscript's been edited, so I can't add it now. But maple syrup. I, I use maple syrup in my coffee. And maple syrup has been shown to reduce your dementia risk. So now I pile on. I get the coffee reducing my dementia risk, and I get the maple syrup reducing my dementia risk. Regular sugar instead of the stevia, right? Yes, I think I would use, I use sugar when I don't have maple syrup. So I had sugar in my coffee this morning. Oh, okay. All right. uh, I don't, you could use honey in your coffee, but I think it doesn't taste good. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, with regard to water, I've heard you should drink half your weight in ounces every day. I didn't hear that. I couldn't hear so what, what you said. So do you have a recommendation or just any thought on that? The amount of water you should drink. I, I'm not understanding what's being said here. Oh, I'm sorry. Drinking half your weight in ounces every day in water. In other words, if you weigh 100 pounds, you're going to drink 50 ounces of water a day. That's what I'm saying. So half your weight, if you weigh 100 pounds, you want to drink like 50 pounds of water? No. Let's see. In ounces. That would be that would be like seven gallons of water a day. So what he's saying, what he's saying is that you're supposed to take your body weight and drink half of your body weight in ounces of water daily. Oh, in ounces. Okay. I I, I wouldn't dispute that. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. Yeah. So. So I just had a question about um, a video that I watched recently where uh, it talked about caffeine, uh, reducing your body's ability or your brain's ability to get into REM 3 and 4 sleep at night. To get what? Ca coffee or caffeine reducing the ability of the brain to go into REM 3 and REM 4 sleep at night. Have you heard of that? Of That's what, so again, different people have different responses. Just like there are some people who can take an antihistamine like Benadryl and it knocks them out. Mm -hmm. And other people take a Benadryl and it has no effect like on sleepiness at all. Mm -hmm. Some people are very sensitive to the caffeine effects and therefore they shouldn't do it. There are other people that can have it and it doesn't really have those effects. So I think there's, there, there's variability from person to person. But yes, my patients, if they have sleep disorder and they don't get their good sleep, then I, I tell them they need to taper down and get off their caffeine completely until they actually restore normal sleep and then they can tie, try to bring some back in. Caffeine is a six hour half-life. What that means, if you take 100 milligrams of caffeine at 6 a.m., at noon you'll have 50 milligrams in your system, at 6 p.m. you'll have 25 milligrams in your system, at midnight you'll have 12 and a half milligrams in your system, at 6 a.m. you'll have 6 and a quarter milligrams in your system, and now you drink another 100 milligrams, so you have 106 milligrams. At noon you've got 53 milligrams, and so forth and so on. Um, so yes, you can build up a caffeine load over time, and so there's probably important to have some where you maybe don't even drink it every day, but skip it some days and let it clear. So I think there's, there's elements here, and that's why I said caffeine or caffeinated coffee should be considered more of a medicinal than the other medicinal, meaning a medicine. And when you think of a medicine, you have to weigh the pros and the cons and the risks versus benefit ratio, where you don't really need to think that way when you're thinking almonds, pecans, and walnuts, and pomegranate. You can just take those. You don't really think about the risks. So uh, is there no questions related to any of the Bible stuff we talked about? <laughs> All we're talking about is brain stuff here. I have a, I have a question. Go ahead. On Ezekiel's temple. So you talked about the heavenly temple yeah. and the earthly temple. Do you have some ideas about the temple in Ezekiel? I don't. Okay. No. Are you talking about the one Lucifer used to walk amongst in Ezekiel 28? Uh, it's toward, the, I don't remember exactly which chapter, but it's, it talks about a temple that was never really built. It was never built? It was never built in the uh, Old Testament. So people are hypothesizing will it be built before the end of time in Jerusalem. No, I, 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 don't, I haven't really even looked at that, oh, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a question plus a comment. A question, talking about sweeteners, what about agave? About what? Agave. Agave? Yes. Yeah, agave is a fruit, right. is it not? Yeah, so agave fruit, if you want to use agave fruit concentrate, yeah. that would be fine. Sure. And the comment is just that coconut oil, if you ingest it, does increase 
potential, a lot, the LDL cholesterol. The what? LDL cholesterol goes up with coconut oil with ingestion. Coconut oil. I see a couple of hands over here. Hand, uh, oh, you have the, oh, right there. Go ahead. You have your hand up. Yeah. This, this isn't. This is more. Well, this is an Alan White question. <laughs> it's, okay. It's from Christian Education and Teaching. Um, the, that's the name of the book. This is something that my sister sent me that's always kind of bothered me. Um, and it's a quote about what Jesus says to his father. Um, so it's talking about the sealing about to happen. Um, Jesus was clothed with his priestly garments. He so, gave... So, so, so wait, I, start, start over. I can't hear you, so start over. Should I do loud? On the quote, on the quote. Louder or slower or... Yeah, louder and slower. Loud and slow, okay. That, that's a reverb in here, just hard to hear it. Yeah. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel fly with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do in earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, hold, 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 hold. And then I'm going to skip forward because she asks her angel, what does that mean? Um, let me see, I'm going to skip here. Um, he said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth and that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds that they were about to let them go. But the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed, and he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them, etc. So, um... When was it written? What's that? When was it written? Oh. I don't know. Shall I see if I can find out? No, I suspect it was written before 1860. Okay. In the early, early period. So who was she writing to? Do you think this was to be taken literally or metaphorically? Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Okay, so do you think it was my red corpuscles, my red corpuscles? Do you think that's what he meant? No, the part that bothers me is like, if, I mean, they're the same. So why would they even need to be like, hey, wait a second. Exactly. You're going the exact right direction. And, and so that's the confusing part to me is like, it sounds like, it sounds like one of them's doing one thing that's not even aware of the other one. And so whenever you read stories like this, and we should put them under the umbrella of all, if you want to believe it's inspired, which, which I'm, I'm okay with. I, I believe Ellen White was inspired. Okay. We should put it under the umbrella of other inspired stories from Scripture, like First Kings, six, First Kings 22, when Ahab asked Jehoshaphat to join him in war against Ramoth Gilead, and Jehoshaphat asked for a prophet of the Lord, and they called Micaiah, not Micah, Micaiah. Micaiah says that uh, to Ahab, says the Lord had a council in heaven and asked his angels how we can lure Ahab into his death against Ramoth Gilead. One spirit suggested this, another spirit suggested that, and then one finally said, I know, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets. And the Lord said, go and do it. This is scripture now. The greater light, Ellen White's the lesser light. Do we believe that is exactly what happened? This is a prophet of the Lord telling exactly what, the, what he was told from his inspired sources that what was happening in the conversation in heaven, do we believe that God sends lying spirits to lie? But that's what the prophet told him. Why? Why was this written like Ellen White this way? Because it's literally happening this way? I mean, describing some other thing seen in heaven. We've got a scene in heaven in, in 1 Kings 16, 1 Kings 22. We have a scene in heaven from Ellen White. Is this literally what's happening? 
See, people want to think it is. It doesn't fit with Jesus, John 16, 26. Here's Jesus' words now, not Ellen White's words, Jesus himself. I will not pray the Father for you because the Father himself loves you. Mm -hmm. Now, are we going to have Ellen White contradict Jesus? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Jesus didn't really mean that. He was a little confused. He was still on earth. He was distressed at that time. I know better. So it's an illustrative story of what's occurring and so happened. Who, do we believe that there were lying spirits coming from God to lie to Ahab? Do we believe that? Because that's what it says. I don't hear any yeses or noes. No. Then why does it say it if that's not what was happening? Why would Ellen White describe it if it wasn't actually happening that way? There's a lesson. I'm wanting you to reason it out. Why would the prophets, Micaiah, Tell Ahab that God sent a lying spirit to be in the mouth of his prophet if God did not send a lying spirit. Why would he say it? So the people would understand at that time. What would in, they understand? Well, in their own way, what the level of understanding is. Yes, you're going the right direction. So he was trying to, to get King Ahab, in this case, to understand something. Was he trying to get King Ahab to understand that God lies? Was that what he was, he was trying to do? You, you should know God's a liar. No. No, that's not what he was trying to get. What was he trying to get King Ahab to understand? What's happening? What's the context? Ahab's trying to go to war to Ramoth Gilead. He's trying to get Jehoshaphat to go to war to Ramoth Gilead. What's the impact of the message from Micaiah? Go or don't go? What do you think the impact is? When, when, the, when Micaiah says, have I lost you guys? When Micaiah says to Ahab, God sent a lying spirit, how can we lure Ahab to his death against Ramoth Gilead? I'll just say this. I'll say it. One said, I know I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of this prophet so we can lure him to his death. And God said, go and do it. Does that message incline Ahab to go to war or disincline Ahab to go to war? Disincline. Ah, okay. <laughs> now we're getting there. Who was Ahab a worshiper of? Baal. What kind of God is Baal? Okay, so if you're going to reach a worship over Baal, what kind of a message do you have to send? You have to send a message of an authoritarian power God. You have to explain why the prophets of Baal gave the message go to war. There has to be an explanation that fits his mindset. What's the mindset that God, who is powerful, gave that message because he wanted to lure the Baal worshiper into death so he can replace him? But the real deal, God loves Ahab still, and God doesn't want Ahab to go to his death. And so he sends a message to disincline Ahab in a way that Ahab could understand it and not go to war. It's the message of mercy and love. It has nothing to do, but people who can't think abstractly read that kind of stuff, and they get very confused, and they go, well, that's sovereignty. God's sovereign. If he wants to lie, it's still holy, and it's still not lying. I mean, this is how they think. It's nonsense. So back to the Ellen White quote now. How do we understand it? Do we believe that Jesus, we believe Jesus when he says, I will not pray the Father for you, the Father himself loves you? Or do we believe Ellen White, that he's actually up there pleading with the Father because he's merciful, and if he doesn't plead with the Father, then the Father's not going to have mercy. Do we take that literally, like we take the description in Kings about a lying spirit, or is there some other message? It's not to be taken literally. There's some other message, and this, this message is for who she's writing to. Micaiah's talking to Ahab, trying to get Ahab to disincline him to go to war. Is Ellen White writing to people who have a certain mindset and a certain belief about God already, and they need encouragement? Yeah. And that that's what this message is about. It's about reaching a certain group of people that she's writing to with a message of encouragement and motivation and stimulation to activate them to be prepared, to get themselves ready. God is holding back. God is holding back. God's ready to come. So here's the message if you don't take it literally that they're against each other. God is ready to come and take us. We are not ready to go. And so in mercy he waits. And that whole description was describing that process. So we will get ready because he wants to come get us. 
I don't think there's any tension between them. I think it's a very similar thing to 1 Kings 22. So then Ellen White also has different times where she explains things to different levels of people so they can understand. Not everything that she has written is like I think the, the one you quoted there is absolutely the hardest one of hers to understand in those contexts. Most of the other ones, she actually says he, is before, he, pleads, he pleads before the Father. This particular one, it has him pleading to the Father. So only one time that I know of that she actually constructed it that way. She has other places and multiple places where she says she's in heaven, he's in heaven pleading before the Father rather than to the Father. And those are actually much easier to understand because Jesus said to his apostles, it's expedient for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the comforter won't come. When the comforter comes, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Who's the comforter listening to? He's listening to Jesus. He is Jesus' representative on earth now. And so in heaven, Jesus is pleading. He's not pleading to persuade the Father. The Father doesn't need persuading. Who needs persuading? We need persuading. Stand at the door and knock. Let you so he is in heaven before the Father, carrying out the Father's purpose. God was in the Son, reconciling the world to himself. If God is for you, who can be against you? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. He's in the heaven before the Father, carrying out the Father's purpose, pleading to you and me, I died for you, I love you, I've got the remedy, let me heal you. And the Holy Spirit hears his pleas and communicates those pleas to your heart and mind, and that's much easier to understand. The one to the Father makes it a little bit more difficult. We have to do a little bit more deep thinking and realize that this is not literal because he's not going to contradict what Jesus himself said, that, he's, that, that there's no need for him to pray, and he's not going to pray the Father for us. So this has to be another illustration that's basically simply telling us God wants to come get us. He's ready. We're not. Get ready. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so how, how did Christ's death... Um, provided a remedy for one to be restored to the lightness of... Power. So what do we understand the remedy to sin is? Uh, trust, trust in God? No, trust is not the remedy. Trust is the avenue through which we partake the remedy. If you have, if you have a terminal illness and a doctor has a antibiotic uh, uh, and, and uh, anti-cancer medicine that will cure you, you have to trust the doctor in order to take it. If you think the doctor is against you and he's trying to murder you, you will not take it. Even if it's a true cure, you won't take it. So trust establishes a relationship where you'll partake of what he has. So, 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 so we are not saved by trust. We're saved by grace through trust. So the Bible uses the word grace, but specifically, what does grace provide for us? Trust is necessary. That opens the avenue to receive it. But what is the actual, literal, achieved remedy? Do, can we name it? Pardon? A connection back to God. The connection back to God is the trust relationship. The trust relationship opens the heart to receive it. What are we receiving from God? Character. Thank you. We're receiving a perfected human character. New desires, new motives. But I thought character cannot be transferred. It has to be experienced by one to develop that. So, what we receive, we receive a new heart and right motives and new desires. So in Christ's Object Lessons, um, page 311, the robe woven in the womb of, le of heaven has not one thread of human devising. Um, when we accept Jesus, um, our thoughts are brought into unity with his thoughts. Our desires merge with his desire. Our will united with his will. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed in the robe of his righteousness. So we get new desires, a new longing in the heart, a, a, a love for other people, a love for God. That is not generated. We can't create that kind of love. That we receive. Then with that love, we choose. We choose to accept it. We choose to identify with it. We choose to adore it. We choose to embrace it. We choose to say, yes, that's who I want to be. We are making the choices to apply it, but we're receiving it from him. We're not developing it. You can't generate love in your heart by the force of will. That comes from Jesus Christ. We also can't generate truth. Truth comes from Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and life. That's something we have to process, understand. I accept it. I believe it. I choose it. That's something we do. So we're active in this process. So in Desire of Ages 762, Ellen White says, the law requires righteousness, a righteous life. This man has not to give. Christ came in the form of man and developed a perfect character. This he offers as a free gift to all who will accept it. 
His life stands for the life, of, uh, for the life of man. They have remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. But more than this, he builds up the human character in the similitude of the divine. Thus he is just and the justifier of him, of those who believe in Jesus. And so what Jesus achieved, he was tempted in every way like we are, and as a human being exercising human abilities, not divine abilities, he chose to love perfectly and resist all the way to the end the drive to act in self-interest. And if at any point of Long's death, and the only way to eliminate that drive was to die, if at any point along death's approach he acts to stop death, that's an act of self-interest. Selfishness wins. The only way to eliminate that and establish a perfect human character was voluntary self-surrender. This was not suicide. He did not kill himself. He just refused to use power to stop what others were doing to him. And so in the cosmic universe, God has perfect divine character. Gabriel has perfect angelic character. If you believe there are intelligences of other worlds, of other species that we don't know the name of yet, they have perfect character of their order. But until Jesus Christ, there was no perfect <coughs> human character. Christ, and no human being after Adam could do it. Christ had to do it for us. He achieved it. And thus we, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. But we have to, as you say, actively choose to participate in number one, trust, and then number two, application, as we receive what he is providing to us. Does that help? Uh, yeah. So we, we accept the, we're not accepting that char perfect character, right? The character has been developed, but we accept, uh, so what are we accepting, really? I'm not sure what you're saying. Yes, we accept the character of Christ. We accept his desire. We okay. accept the truth of who he is. We accept the, the knowledge. Of, we accept it all. We accept him as our savior. We ask him to come in and dwell with his spirit. And his spirit gives us the power, the desire, the longings, the motives. H have anybody in here besides me actually experienced a change in desire when you invited Jesus in your heart? Okay? That you can't create. That's partaking from Jesus. But does Jesus have the diet to provide us with yes, that desire? Yes, because without him, without him doing that, there is no perfect human link. He's, there's only selfishness in humanity. The only way to put love, Ellen White puts it this way, that Jesus is the, the avenue through which love, uh, God's love is uh, restored into humanity. Any other questions? I think we'll just take a couple more. Yes, over here. Yeah, I'd like you to just talk about uh, when Jesus said he doesn't know when he's coming back, only his father knows. Uh, they're both omniscient from what I understand. When, when, when did Jesus say that? When? When the apostles were questioning him and... Uh, and when was that? And he it, was what, saying, you don't really need to know that. Yeah, you but, don't but need when, to... When was that? Close to his crucifixion close to his so death. So what state was Jesus in at that time? Human. And was he in his human state where he was accessing and using divine abilities? No. Or was he avoiding using divine avoiding. abilities? He was even tempted by the devil to turn bread yes. into stone and other things. Was he accessing and using his own divine prerogatives and abilities or was he living as a human being with human, human limitations? Human. So he's answering as a human being. He doesn't know the answer. It doesn't mean he doesn't know now. Now he's right. back in heaven. That's what I was thinking, that he does know now. At that point in time, he did not know because he was not accessing okay. those abilities. That's, that's kind of what I thought about it. Thank you. Is there another mic that somebody has a question I'm missing? No? Okay. Go ahead. You've described some, uh, a lot of toxins that are in our environment and a lot of inappropriate diet, the media. Uh, it seems to me that our environment is driving people crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have read of any research regarding the detrimental, detrimental effect of electromagnetic radiation upon the function of the brain. We've got now wireless cell phones, wireless internet access. We've got a huge amount of electromagnetic radiation that we're all bombarded with. 
Have you read any research as to whether that's detrimental? I've only read news reports. I have not actually delved into the research to, to look at that, no. But I wouldn't be surprised there's an effect. We are electro-bioelectric beings. Uh, I do transcranial magnetic stimulation in my office for the treatment of depression, which is, which is magnetic pulses that given straight to the brain that actually have antidepressant effects. Electroconvulsive therapy, which gives electrical pulses to the brain, has antidepressant effects. Low uh, direct, uh, direct current to the, to the scalp is now showing to have antidepressant effects in some studies. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, in fact, there's a whole section in my new book on the aging brain about uh, walking barefoot on the earth or touching the earth, grounding, um, where when you, you know, lightning is electrons basically moving, and we have disconnected ourselves from touching the earth, and the earth is a great electron donor, and we need electrons in our body to do all types of antioxidant stuff, and so touching the ground and letting electrons, like going into salt water in the ocean, or touch your, walking barefoot in your grass, um, this has a lot of healing and, and, and uh, antioxidant effects, and I've got the research in the book talking about that. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if there is going to be something that's going to be documented about electromagnetic fields. I just haven't researched what that might be. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, um, back to mental health. Um, for anyone struggling with uh, bipolar or anxiety, are there any like uh, supplements or foods that you suggest? Omega-3 fatty acids are mood stabilizing in both depression and bipolar patients. Uh, the higher you go, the more mood stabilizing effects. However, I don't take my patients above 4,000 milligrams of omega-3s because they become blood thinners. And at that at higher doses, you can have risk of bleeding and hemorrhagic stroke. So I don't go to those high doses. But one study out of Harvard showed that bipolar patients cheat with 8,000, 7,000 to 8,000 milligrams a day, had mood stabilization without meds. But I don't go that high. And acetylcysteine is also shown to have uh, mitochondrial uh, stabilizing effects, which have mood stabilizing effects in people with mood disorder as well. So both of those nutrients. And then, of course, in people who live in parts of the world that have a little bit higher lithium levels in the water, uh, like the Northwest, have lower bipolar rates in those communities, even though it's not a, what would be considered a therapeutic level of lithium, a low-dose lithium in the water actually has mood stabilizing and prevention of, uh, of bipolar disorder. It reduces the risk. What was the second one you said? N-acetylcysteine, okay. N-A-C. Okay. All right, well, thank you all very much.